Bruce Tonkin, a longtime community member, and just recently uh, left the ICANN board. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us, Bruce. Appreciate it. You're welcome. You've participated in ICANN meetings since 2001. How have you witnessed the the organization become more globalized, become more international? Um, look, I think originally when um, I was first involved with ICANN, there was only about three staff members, uh, and two of those, I think, were in LA, and one of them was outside of LA. So. Um, it was very centralised and everything running out of Los Angeles. Um, then I think the first overseas office that was created um, that had you know, more than one person was in Brussels. Uh, and that was partly to sort of get closer to, uh, I think, the, the European government and, and a degree of government relations. Um, but it also meant that there was an ability to sort of provide a bit of outreach into Europe with, with registrars and others. Uh, so I think that was probably the first office. Uh, and then after that, uh, the next offices would have been in Singapore. Uh, and that meant that we had staff there that were in the same time zone as China. And China's one of the, I guess, the fastest growing regions in terms of domain name registration. And we could have staff that could speak not just Chinese, but um, other languages in that region, sort of Tamil, Korean, mm -hmm. Japanese, etc. So it meant that ICANN was able to sort of communicate in the same time zone and in the same languages as um, you know, parts of the community that it served. Uh, and then I guess the next major office after that was in um, Turkey in Istanbul. And the intent of that was to have an office that was fairly central, uh, not just for Europe, but also be able to reach out into the Middle East, Africa, um, and, uh, and I guess uh, east of that into um, Russia and, and you know states in that region as well. Uh, so I think that's that's probably been the office that's um, you know been harder to establish, I guess. It, it uh, uh, but again, it's it's got people with multiple language skills. It, it's able to serve uh, quite a few of the regions around there, and also sort of brings, I suppose, I can closer to non-traditional. Um, countries that are that are not as Western as, say, um, Brussels or, or Los Angeles or even Singapore, for that matter. It, 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 since its earliest days, ICANN was always envisioned to be a global and international organization. I started with the organization in 2009, and I can remember criticisms then that as much as you say you're international, as much as you say you're global, you're really not. Yes. Was yeah. that a fair criticism back then? I think it is. It's, a lot of it is, uh, is cultural. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the culture of the organisation was very um, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles centric. Uh, and that's, that's, that's in the, the business culture, the legal culture, um, just things like insurance. So the original registry registrar agreements had uh, insurance requirements for a registrar and, and they worked very well in, in, in places like Europe and, and US and Australia but they were much more problematic in parts of the developing world where there wasn't really access to an insurance that sort of immediately met the ICANN needs. Uh, and then people were saying, well, why do we really need that insurance? You know, we, we've got other mechanisms to, to ensure that we can continue to operate, etc." So I think it's just that sort of cultural shift. It's not until you actually have an office with people that live in the region. A presence. Yeah, and it's more than just a presence though. I think you actually have to have people that um, live and breathe the region, like they understand the business environment, they understand the people. Because quite often I think at ICANN, and it's been a struggle at the board level as well, I think, in that to meet some of the diversity requirements, we've said, oh, we've got someone that was born in Africa, or we've got someone that was born in Egypt, and they're on the board. But when you looked underneath that, you'd find that this, these people might have lived in England for 20 years. Um, and so they're, you know, they're, they're really used to the um, Western business environment. They're not actually doing business in the environment where they they were born. And I think by establishing the offices um, in regions where the staff in those offices have probably spent you know the majority of their life in that region, they've got they've had business experience in that region, and hence they're able to talk not just the same language in the sense of the um, you know, whether it's Japanese or, or, or Chinese, but actually the same language in terms of, of business. Why is it even important? Why, why is it important that the organization be international, that it have an, an international orientation? Um, I think 
basically because you, you, you talk about the origins of the internet and it started in the academic sector and the research sector in the US and it spread to, I guess, countries that were um, fairly closely related to the US, so um, the sort of England, Australia, etc., all fairly early adopters of the internet. But now when you're looking at where's internet growth coming from, the internet growth is actually coming from the developing world and ICANN needs to adapt to that um, and adapt to their special needs, I think. Uh, and, the, and the best way of doing that is to actually you know, set up offices in, in those regions, staff them with people that are familiar with those regions. Your early involvement with ICANN was through Melbourne IT, one of the first five registrars, I believe, in competition with Network Solutions. Yes. Um, ICANN's mandate is tied to increasing competition in the domain space. How would you describe the relationship between promoting competition and ICANN's increasing globalization? Um, yeah, well, I, look, I think if, you, if interesting if you look at where those first five testbed registrars were from. Um, they were basically, I think, Melbourne IT from Australia, certainly the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I think about three of them might have been, yeah, at least three of them were North America. And I think there was one from Europe, might have been France Telecom or someone like that in Australia. So even, even back then you realise how limited it was in terms of global coverage. Uh, now if you look at uh, where are the new registrars coming from that are applying for accreditation at ICANN and they're more likely to be coming from Asia and China and other places. So I think the competi there's, there's very heavy competition in the, in the US and Australia with, with many registrars, um, but the competition in other parts of the world is often much lower in that, particularly in African countries, you might just have one party that's accredited, there's really no other choice apart from using an overseas or uh, outside of country registrar. Um, so I think part of ICANN's mandate is probably to encourage uh, registrars to, to become accredited from underserved regions. And those registrars in turn uh, are able to do business with the local community that's probably different to the way we do business in other countries. So for example, in many of these developing countries, um, there's not as much electronic commerce, it's much more cash oriented. Uh, and so, you know, how do you actually pay and register a domain name when you may not actually have a computer in the first place? Um, so that requires going to some sort of store or, or location where the registrar is and actually paying cash and getting your domain name. A lot of the r large registrars in the world, the sort of GoDaddies and the Melbourne ITs, aren't really designed around that business model. So I think we need registrars in these uh, different or underserved regions that conduct business um, in the way that the local community finds easiest to deal with. Someone once told me that, that the only reason I can't works, particularly in the global arena, is because people buy into it. Is that an oversimplification or is that fair? Yeah, I think that is fair, yeah. I, th I think basically people buy into the concept that there is a, a, a single unified route uh, and you're not getting name conflicts and so you can use the, a particular domain name and you can use it wherever you are in the world and it, and it gives you the same result. Um, you're not sort of finding that, oh, okay, when I type this name and I'm in another country, it goes somewhere else. And people, people are now conditioned that one address, when you're in your web browser and you type in that one address, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it takes you to the same place. Yes, yeah. Now things are getting a little bit more sophisticated now because um, what a lot of websites will do is they will look at the IP address that's coming in from where you're accessing the website and they might change the language of the website to match the location where you are. So for example, if you, if you, you might access a, a common website or, a, or a, you know, maybe an airline website or something and, and you're in Denmark and it will actually come up in Danish because it's detected that you are um, now located in Denmark. You were chair of DNSO before becoming chair of the GNSO. And in an earlier interview, you once described the split of country codes from generic names as similar to Brexit. What did you mean by that? <laughs> Dude, I must have been around that at the time of Brexit, yeah. Yeah, it was strange because in many ways, we're saying we're trying to create a relatively um, unified set of rules around domain names and practices around business practices, if you like, around domain names. And I think the, the country codes very much wanted their independence. So 
Um, and, and actually that's in, in many ways similar to sort of the Brexit concept is that they wanted to maintain their sovereignty and their own control of their, their country names. And they sort of felt, well, we're happy to get together in issues that relate to how do we get um, names and changes made to the root zone file. But they really didn't want to be involved in discussions about, you know, how should domain name transfers work or how should private registrations work and things like that, because they felt that they wanted to have their own rules and regulations around that. So it's very similar to the Brexit concept where you, you're finding, um, you know, one country is basically saying, well, we want to control our own rules and regulations. We don't want some other um, country or group of countries defining how we should operate. How difficult is it to explain this funky organization called ICANN where policy is made from the bottom up it's got a wide, uh, widely diverse board. How difficult is it to explain this very unusual model to people in other countries and other languages who perhaps are not sa as savvy with the internet and its function? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is, um, and again, it's partly cultural, but uh, is, is the different balance in countries between private sector and public sector in, in the way the country is managed or in the way business is done. So if you look at ICANN, you know, it's based in the US. The, the majority of, of citizens probably work for the private sector in some way. Um, they're mostly interacting with the private sector in their, in their daily lives. And yes, there's, there's government there for essential services like um, you know, getting a driver's license or something. But uh, other services like um, you know, electricity, water, um, telecommunications have increasingly become in the private sector mm -hmm. uh, and you see that as a trend across many of the big developed economies and so in that environment you can explain a bottom-up process by saying you know in the past uh, things like telecommunications regulation it was generally a government-owned monopoly that ran the telecommunications in infrastructure um, and then most of the countries that also had that same model and so most of the rules and regulations around telephones were basically done at a government level, government to government, basically. And that was through the ITU. Um, and the shift, I think, that happened with the, uh, the US at the time had a privatised telecommunications system, multiple telephone companies. And then the internet sort of grew up in that environment as well with really no single control. There's no one company that runs all of the internet. And so that model naturally fitted the ICANN model because it's saying, well, it should be bottom up. You know, we've got lots of different businesses that operate parts of the internet. We have lots of different businesses that provide domain registration and provide registries. And so it's not just one single company that should define the rules. So you have this bottom-up process saying, well, if, if you want to operate an internet registry or registrar, come along to ICANN and then you work out amongst yourselves what the rules should be. Get input from people like the non-commercial sector, get input from intellectual property lawyers, get input from ISPs, but you, you work that out because there's no central control. And then you come up with a policy and then the board's really looking to see, did that policy take into account all the concerns of the community? You know, did it follow a proper process um, and then approve it? So it's a bottom-up approach. But when you're dealing with other parts of the world where, um, and this is sort of part of ICANN's challenge, I think, is that you, we sort of ask for participation. We talk to a country in a developing world and they go, well, how do we get involved? And we sort of say, well, get all your, you know, ISPs together, get your registrars, get to the, you know, tell them to come to ICANN. And they go, we don't have any of those. You know, the, the government owns the, mm -hmm. the internet or the government owns the telephone infrastructure. We just have government people. Um, and so it's, it's a very different model. And so that government is, is basically used to maybe doing some local consultation, but then they send one rep to the meeting who's the government rep and, and they represent the country completely. And that's the complete opposite with, uh, say, um, the United States or Australia. If you think about how many people from the United States are here in Copenhagen, it's um, well above one. Uh, Bruce, what is the, going forward from where we're at now, what is the greatest challenge to ICANN's continued international expansion? Challenge to international expansion. Um, or acceptance. Yeah, they're, they're two different things, I think. Um, I, I think definitely one of the challenges to acceptance is that 
you, you have, as you start rolling the um, services out to other countries where they're predominantly public sector, you know, government operated, um, they sort of say, well, you know, this, this is a topic for governments, not the private sector. Uh, and so I think that's a challenge on, on one side. Um, and I think the other challenge that we have is the, in many ways, the expectations of ICANN are very high. So, and, and we, we, we see that all the time with, you know, topics of law enforcement. And if you look at what are the big media topics around the internet, there's obviously concerns that um, terrorists take advantage of, of the communication tools to, to, to do their activities. Um, there's concerns that criminal organisations take advantage of the tools to conduct their criminal activities. And I think in the past, before communication networks, things were very localised. So um, if there was a crime done, the, the person that conduct, committed that crime is going to be within a few miles of, of the crime scene, let's say, or the person that was affected by that crime. So it was all driven by local police. They would know the people in the neighbourhood if they were investigating a crime against a person. They know, well, the person that committed that crime is pretty close. It's all very localised. And I think the challenges of the internet now is that um, if someone has been um, the victim of, of a fraud, um, from a police perspective, um, let's say that victim was in Australia, uh, but the person that actually committed that crime could be anywhere in the world. Uh, and I think the level of cooperation still between police forces is, is um, might be high on, t on certain topics, but on, on many other topics, um, the level of cooperation is probably not quite there. And so then people go, well, let's use this ICANN thing, because that seems to have all the people that are involved in the internet and they're, they're all coming to, to these meetings. Why don't we get them to help us? And there's this pressure on ICANN to increase its scope from technical coordination of the DNS to, you know, why don't we um, get together and solve crime and get together and solve terrorism and get together and solve security Expand problems. Expand the mandate. Yeah, the so mission. there's this, this pressure in that either you expand the mandate of ICANN um, or you, you actually try and um, say, well, we don't need ICANN because um, you know, this, is what, this should all be done by um, you know, government bodies, United Nations or some equivalent. Now that the IANA stewardship transition has been completed, is for a long time when that was being debated, an argument in support of it was that other countries, it would actually bait, if you would, the authoritarian takeover that so many feared in resisting the transition. Now that the transition has occurred, is that threat gone? Well, it, it depends on what who the threat is to. Is it, are we talking about a threat to ICANN or threat to something else? Uh, yeah. Well, let's deal with the threat yeah. to ICANN. Yeah. So I, certainly I think one of the concerns was that um, governments that didn't like the idea of, in their mind, a, a US sort of controlled entity controlling parts of the infrastructure that they now view as critical. It's a little bit like, um, you know, in, in the, if, you, if you're thinking a few hundred years ago, the critical thing was to control the seaways, because um, that was effectively the method of transferring goods and um, and almost like the communication mechanism that you, if you could control the sea, you could obviously control what goods were transferred and you could control who was getting transferred. Uh, etc. So the internet's kind of now the modern equivalent of, of, of the seas and we're saying well we have in certainly in the oceans we're, we're saying this is neutral territory you know you, you can control the sea that's within a few miles of your coast uh, but outside of that there's international waters and you know everyone's sort of free to, to traverse those waters and the internet's very much like that as well and that we're saying we've got this internet it's like the international waters everyone's free to transfer information across it you might control the information in your local network um, that's on your sovereign soil but other than that once you've sent your information into the wider internet it can go anywhere so certainly i think that's both an economic plus to countries because they're able to um, conduct commerce on a much wider basis than they ever had before but it's also a threat on things like um, information flows. So if a government previously wanted to control information flows, it would just control the newspapers and control the, the TV stations that were all local to, to, that, um, to that country. 
Now information flows can come from the, Much the, more difficult now. the international waters, if you like. And I think there's always the threat to the internet that authoritarian regimes will go, um, we have to isolate ourselves to stop this information flow um, because we want to control the information that our um, you know, citizens are receiving. So I think that's a, a wider threat to the internet. I don't see it necessarily as a threat to ICANN, but certainly um, those countries that feel that they want to control the information flows may feel that they can influence processes um, in um, United Nations or other things more so than they can influence a, an ICANN process. You said yourself um, ICANN began as a result of U.S. research. Did you as an Australian citizen coming in to the ICANN fold early on see that as problematic where you accepted? Was it difficult let me, let me rephrase that. Did that Australian lens give you a different vision than what your U.S. counterparts had? Yes, I, I think so. It, it's, um, uh, I think one of the things that's interesting in ICANN is that um, it, it's often the, the smaller countries that end up in, um, their citizens often end up in leadership positions at ICANN, and uh, you'll see it frequently from Australians, they'll often be chairs of the different groups, but you also see it in Scandinavia. You know, it's the, the smaller countries that will often have um, their members. Um, you know, they might be chair of a, an advisory committee or a supporting committee or a nominating committee. They're often coming from the smaller countries because they they recognise the need to compromise. And I think, uh, you know, ICANN fundamentally is a is a consensus building body, and you need to find the areas of consensus amongst people. And I think. If you're coming from nations outside of the U.S. and you realise, well, Australia can't, um, you know, using the seas example, you know, we, we're not big enough, we don't have a big enough navy, we can't control the seas, um, so we have to work with the, the, the superpowers of the world um, to ensure that we can export our goods and things. And I think it's the same sort of in the internet world that the countries like Australia or Denmark that are having to trade with um, the surrounding countries and have to compromise because they, they, they're not big enough to dominate anything. Um, that tends to build people that have got more of a um, culture, if you're right, if you like, around finding the, um, the areas of compromise. What I'm hearing from you is a general tone of optimism about the future as regards ICANN and its internationalization. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, look, I think, um, I think ICANN has evolved tremendously in the last 10 years and, and become far more globalised. Uh, I think in, in particular the Asia, one that I'm more familiar with, I guess, in the Asia-Pacific region, but just talking to the staff in that office and even talking to um, registrars in that region, that you know they found it intimidating, if you like, to come to an ICANN meeting because they don't understand the language, it's all happening very fast. There's new rules that they have to keep complying with and they never really understand what those rules are. Um, whereas now they've got a local office that can actually properly communicate with them and understands their business more. Um, and then they, I think the first step is just helping them understand and helping them work out how to comply with, with our rules. But the next step I think you'll see is that as they gain more confidence, um, they'll start getting a lot more involved in the policy development process. and. I, I think on using China as an example, um, I've seen them evolve dramatically in the last 10 years between having virtually no one attend ICANN meetings to now having quite a few people from both public and private sector in, in China participating, not just turning up, but actually um, you know, coming up to the microphone and speaking and, uh, and participating in the activities. That's great. Bruce, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You're welcome.